Welcome, if you guys are just joining. Thank you, thank you. Feel free to do whatever you want, just don't be a jerk. <laughs> if you just joined, feel free to also uh, introduce yourself in the chat so we can network there before we get started. Um, we do wanna start these on time because we know people are super busy uh, doing a lot of nonsense. So we're gonna try our hardest to make this just 30 minutes and then any questions we'll take after 30 minutes and you can stick around. And of course, you can also put your questions in the chat. Um, if you are joining us and you've never been to a meeting before or if you just heard about us, Thank you so much for coming on. That's awesome. Our plan is working wonderfully. We really want to unite like-minded people that work in the Nevada cannabis market so we can move commerce forward fairly uh, and well and have our voice be heard. Um, so you can check us out on our website or on our IG if you haven't been there. Usually we post all of our announcements on our IG. There are two announcements I want to make everyone aware of before we do turn it over to our attorneys. Uh, the first one is we are going to be making a really cool hype video on this Saturday, the 27th. And if you want to be a part of it, um, it's going to be super fun and easy. All you got to do is dress up in your favorite powerhouse outfit and meet us at the steps of 333 Las Vegas Boulevard. It is the Lloyd George Courthouse. And if you're not familiar with it, this is a picture of it. Okay. But kind of by the donut bar is where you want to park. Um, so that is at 1230. It's really just 1230 to one. Culture and Canvas is going to be shooting the video. We're all going to be walking up the steps of the courthouse like we're going to take it over to Meek Mill's wins and losses the first 47 seconds of the song. I listen to it every single morning when I wake up a grumpy little brat and it really changes my attitude. So I uh, highly recommend. The next option if you want to get involved is the same day at two o'clock. We are going to have our community event helping New Era Las Vegas hand out necessities um, to a community uh, villa what villa oh the information is on our story um, so check that out but it will say the address and it's just from two to four Alrighty, now we are going to turn it over <clears throat> Seamus and mr daniel are <laughs> chamber hey how's it going you got Seamus here Can hey you guys me? it's daniel thanks for having us yeah Th thanks a ton. Daniel, you want to uh, put yeah, up the Yeah, I'm going to share the PowerPoint here real quick. All right. So can everyone see it? Or can, can you guys see it on screen? Tina, can you see it? Awesome. I, I can see it. Yeah, I think we're good. Yep, we're okay. good. All right. So, so I'm Seamus Flynn, together with Daniel, who you just met, uh, my partner. We, want, we run the Flynn Judici Law Firm. So first of all, we want to just thank the Chamber for, for bringing us on. We are super stoked about this. We think it's incredibly sort of instructive, and we think it's great that you know, folks want to learn more about kind of business organizations. So who are we? So we are a general business law firm. Um, we do a lot of different things, right? We focus on, like, you know, obviously, cannabis environmental land issues. We do administrative law. We do tax services. Uh, we do trust in the state. So we do a little bit of everything. So we think we, you know, so we're sort of a one-stop shop for law firms. Um, before we kind of kick into the broader uh, presentation, I kind of want to caveat and say, this is like a 30,000 foot overview of business organizations. We couldn't possibly get into all of the nuances in 30 minutes. And so there's people that spend semesters learning about this stuff in business school and law school. So you're going to get just the wave tops from some of the more popular kind of business organizations, S corps, LLCs, uh, partnerships. Um, so we kind of just want to caveat with that. So I'm going to kick it to Daniel, who's going to talk a little bit more about our firm itself uh, with respect to like our cannabis uh, services. Yeah. So Basically, here's um, our cannabis practice area and sort of the services that we offer to cannabis specific businesses. Um, it's compliance advice, licensing assistance, uh, transactional services, um, support with the CCB, with your localities, um, dispute resolution, re re resolution for any kind of contract disputes you may have. And then we do kind of some general tax consulting. 
um, kind of like 30,000 foot view on the tax consulting, uh, kind of setting up the right entities, that kind of um, tax consulting advice. Um, so um, with that, we'll kind of get into our background a little bit. All right, so, so who, who am I? I was, I graduated from college. I joined the Marine Corps. I did uh, four years in the Marine Corps. I did a 12 month combat deployment, as you can see here to Afghanistan. I attended law school on the GI Bill. And after law school, I did a follow one year where I studied tax for a year and I received what's called a tax LLM. Daniel actually has one too. It's a specialty in tax law. Um, after that, I went to PwC, which is the global consulting firm. And I did mergers and acquisitions work there. I did a lot of tech deals in Silicon Valley. It was a fascinating job. I learned about all sort of Silicon Valley and the ins and outs. And I then had the opportunity sort of a once in a lifetime gig to clerk for Judge Rawlinson, who sit, sits on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. She's in Las Vegas. She's actually at the federal courthouse where the chamber is going to have their pictures taken on Saturday. If you don't know anything about Judge Rawlinson, I encourage you to Google her and learn more about her. She's a fascinating person. She's sort of a trailblazer in many respects. I then went back to the Bay Area and I served at a global law firm called Baker Botts. Uh, it's a it's a anchored out of Texas, sort of an energy and environmental law firm. And that's kind of where I dipped my toes into cannabis. I did a lot of environmental uh, land use, and there's a lot of crossover with cannabis. Um, and I'm licensed in California and in Nevada. So, you know, if you have any concerns about, you know, California issues, Nevada issues, I'm definitely uh, a good resource. So what about you, Daniel? Yeah, so like Seamus, uh, I uh, attended college at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, then uh, after that, I actually did a short stint working for a United States Senator in the Capitol. Um, and then right after that, I worked on a, a Senate campaign here in the state of Nevada. Um, and then worked in the local office here in Reno for the Senator. Um, after that, I decided, you know, I kind of wanted a different change. So I, I went to law school. Um, that's where I met Seamus, uh, my first year of law school. Uh, and then I transferred to uh, Loyola down in LA um, and I uh, finished up there. Um, like Seamus talked about earlier, I got my tax LLM from the University of San Diego. Um, you know, and then after I graduated from USD, uh, I got into the Nevada cannabis industry and um, I've helped a, a cultivation facility and a production facility. Um, I've helped uh, other people get licenses. I've gotten business licenses in, in different localities down south. Um, you know, so just kind of have, have some pretty hands-on experience. Um, one of the things I can bring to the cannabis space is that I've been in the grow rooms and I've, I've done that kind of stuff. So. I, I offer a more unique perspective than I think most lawyers do. So I, I, can, uh, uh, I, I can attest to what you're going through on a day-to-day -day basis, because oh. I've definitely been there. So with that said, we wouldn't be good lawyers without uh, offering our legal disclaimer. So I'll kick it back to Seamus. Yeah, so to, to piggyback here on Daniel, I just wanted to throw a couple things out. So anything that's written on these slides or anything that we say, uh, should not be construed as forming any type of attorney-client relationship with you all. Uh, we're not your lawyers at this point, and so we're not providing legal advice. So we kind of just want to put that out there. To the extent you want legal advice or you want to talk about, you know, your matter, your issue, we invite you to, you know, email us or call us, and we can have a more kind of fulsome discussion about, you know, what you got going on. The other thing I want to say that I meant to say earlier is if you guys have any questions kind of that come up during these slides, just, you know, send it here to this chat function. I'll kind of monitor that. And to the extent we have time, uh, we'll come back and we'll try to answer them. So I think that's yep yeah, to you. So yeah, basically we'll get started now talking about the uh, business organizations. So um, just a kind of a starting point, uh, we'll talk about some specific areas on if you wanted to start a Nevada cannabis business. So I guess your first consideration is what kind of business do you want to start? Are you looking to get a license that's actually producing cannabis or selling cannabis, or do you want to start a, um, a service business that supports cannabis? Um, so if you want to start a cannabis business where you're actually producing or selling cannabis, you're going to need to meet certain capitalization requirements with the state. I think we all know, or, or most of you know, that there's a $250,000 minimum uh, liquid asset requirement in order to get a cannabis license right now. Um, and that's just at the state level. In fact, 
In certain localities like the city of Henderson, they require an even bigger threshold of, of liquid assets in order to get a license. So that's kind of one of the biggest barriers to access to licenses right now is that capitalization requirement. And beyond just those liquid assets that you have to have to get a license, this is a very intensive capital business. If you don't have the capitalization, then you're not going to be able to build out your facility or do what you need to do. So that's definitely one of the most kind of important considerations when you um, are looking to start any kind of business, especially in cannabis. So legal requirements are, are you know, maintaining your licenses. Those are some of the kind of things that, that kind of get lost in the shuffle. You, you know, you want to go out, you want to build your brand, you want to get started. Um, so, you, you know, you're, you're working, uh, you're trying to sell your products and do those kinds of things and filing your taxes or setting up the right business or, you know, making sure your licenses are handled correctly. Those are kind of things that get lost in the shuffle. Uh, local hurdler, hurdles are, you know, one of the biggest things that we see uh, that people do wrong is um, they don't have licenses for the certain localities that they're working in. Now you may have a license in the city of Reno, for example, um, but you're doing business in say uh, Clark County. Um, there are circumstances where you may need a Clark County business license as well. So you kind of want to be mindful of those kinds of things. Um, so with that said, we'll kind of get into uh, our business entity discussion and kind of give you a broad overview of what kind of things to consider uh, when you are starting a business. Sure, so, so like I said, at the top, we just want to focus on kind of the, the, the big targets here. There's a ton of different entities out there. You can research, you can find all different kinds. And each state sort of allows for different entities. And some states allow some, other states don't allow others. So, but we wanted to hit kind of the wave top one. So we're going to talk about sole proprietorship. We're going to talk about partnerships, so general and limited. And we're going to talk about corporations. And then we're going to talk, we'll finish it off with, you know, which is probably the biggest one, which is LLCs. So, so sole proprietorships, um, basically a sole proprietorship is, for example, you go out and you set up a widget stand on the side of the road and you're selling your widgets. Uh, if you don't do any kind of filing of any art or articles of organization, you don't have a corporate charter, you're just out there selling, selling something, um, you formed a sole proprietorship. You're carrying on a business uh, to generate a profit. So with that said, um, here we want, we'll talk about some of the disadvantages and advantages of a sole proprietorship. But before I get into that, I just kind of want to mention, um, we'll kind of come back to this as this disregarded entity thing. Um, so basically what a disregarded entity is, is even if you go through the process of setting up, say an LLC or a corporation, if there's only one single member, um, as far as the IRS is concerned, it's a disregarded entity and you're going to get passed through taxation, which we'll touch on a little bit more regardless. So um, you do get the protections that we'll talk about a little bit later, but you, you will be considered the DRE. So here's some of the um, advantages and disadvantages to the sole proprietorship. So basically the main advantage is there's simple uh, filing requirements. You actually don't need to file on anything with anybody. Um, you know, you're just basically doing business with your tax ID number or your uh, social security number. Um, the ease of doing business is again, no, no formalities. Um, one of the nice things is you have complete management and control. Um, and then and again, you get that pass through no double taxation. Um, disadvantages are basically you're on the hook for everything. Uh, no matter what you do, you're 100% you're liable and there's no limits to that liability. So. You know, if you're selling your back to the widgets and one explodes and injures uh, one of your customers, then you're completely on the hook for all those injuries. You're not protected by uh, your, your corporation or your LLC. Another thing is it's tied to the life of the owner. It can only last as long as the single owner is alive. It doesn't pass. Um, uh, the, uh, the main disadvantage to sole proprietorships are it's hard to raise capital. And the reasons why is because nobody has an interest in that sole proprietorship. So they're not able to take anything out. So, um, you know, that's why it's hard to raise capital. So I'll kick it to Seamus for uh, general partnerships. So you listen to Daniel, he talks to you about kind of running your own show. What happens if you say, look, I want to bring someone else in the fold. I kind of want to hedge some of my risk. Well, then you're probably going to enter into a partnership. And there's so many different types of partnerships. We won't even get into them, obviously. But the big one, right, is a general partnership. 
And so like, how is a general partnership formed? And like, what is it? You know, is it a formal thing? Is it informal? So what it is, is it's just literally two or more partners who are responsible for a business, you know, enterprise in terms of debts and operations, you know, each partner is contributing money and skill and sort of, you know, different assets. And so that's really all it is. It, it is, does not take a written agreement. So for instance, Daniel and I could start uh, a lemon stand, you know, lemonade stand, and we each kick in 50 bucks. Well, we have this partnership, this general partnership, and it doesn't have to be like a formal agreement. And so obviously there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to this. So if you want to go to the next one. So what are the advantages? Look, probably the biggest one is just ease of formation. They're very easy. Like I said, it doesn't take a written requirement. And so anyone could start it. You know, two folks tonight can literally start a general partnership. It's very simple from a tax perspective. It's called pass-through taxes. I'm sure you've heard of this term, but basically the entity itself isn't taxed and the tax what's called flows through to the individual. So back to the lemonade stand, Daniel and I were running our lemonade stand. We have a partnership, which is the actual entity. And at the end of the year, we go to do our taxes, the entity's taxes, it'll flow through that and it'll go to Daniel and I's personal income tax. So that's a big benefit. What are the disadvantages? Well, it goes back to that sole proprietorship uh, liability uh, Daniel was talking about, which is sort of this unlimited liability. There's not a lot of protection there. So a lot of people are hesitant to do these general partnerships because there is a lot of liability. The other thing is sort of management issues. If you have four people running you know, a coffee shop, that's sort of four voices uh, sort of you know, calling the shots and you know, you're, there's a lot of discussion about money and how this thing's gonna be run. And if it's not sort of correctly organized, it can get really messy. So uh, that's one of the biggest di uh, disadvantages. Obviously sort of raising capital can be difficult too. It's, it's, it's not the most formal entity. Um, so if you're not gonna do a general partnership, there's also this thing called a limited partnership, which Dan is gonna talk about. Yeah, so the, the main difference between a limited partnership and a general partnership is the limited liability. So I'll, um, you still get the uh, pass, pass through taxation. Um, the, uh, the main difference though, is that there is one general partner that needs to be on the hook. So um, they're on the hook for the unlimited liability that we've talked about in sole proprietorships and in general partnerships. Um, but one of the nice things about a limited partnership is you have the ability to sign on limited partners. And this is good for raising capital. So people can basically come in and put in their capital, get a small percentage of the entity, and they, they're not on the hook for, for any of the uh, liabilities. Um, they're just basically on the hook for the capital that they put in. Um, it also, there's separation of ownership and management. You can have managers managing and owners just kind of owning limited share. Uh, which is a lot of people like for again raising capital purposes um, the disadvantages the main one is it takes like um, some of the corporations and other things there's a lot of formalities required in, in order to maintain these entities you've got to file different uh, information informational returns uh, you've got to have meetings every once in a while you've got to keep your meeting minutes um, you've got to go through all those kind of corporate formalities that that, that are kind of a pain in the neck when you're running a business. Um, also the uh, other disadvantages are the expense of forming and running it just based off of some of those concerns we just talked to, or I just talked about. So then I'll uh, kick it back to Seamus. Uh, he'll talk about corporations. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on corporations because I think most folks on here probably, you know, if you're starting a business you, you probably wouldn't be starting a corporation. You might, maybe an S corp. Um, but but here's the deal: a corporation is obviously, you know, think of like these big institutions, the Googles, right? The Pepsi's, the Diet Cokes, excuse me, the Dr. Peppers, right? These are big institutions. They're usually formed as a, what's called a C corp, right? Because it falls under subchapter C of the tax code. There's also an S corp, which I won't touch on too much. But that's more like an LLC, gives you a little bit more flexibility. But when you start a corporation, to the extent you wanted to start a corporation, a C Corp, what are some of the big advantages? Well, most people do it, especially because they're trying to go public and you can raise capital. What you can do is you can issue stock. And so that's why a lot of companies uh, choose to become a C Corp. That's one of the biggest things. It gives you a lot of stability um, in terms of structure. They're 
heavily sort of uh, doctored in terms of lawyers come in, they draft a lot of documents. So there's a lot of structure and stability. There's two big downsides to corporations, especially the C-Corps, which is they're very rigid and there's a lot of formalities. And to my point about law firms, there are certain law firms out there that come in and they just do, let's call it like a board meeting. They'll spend hours billing out to, to help a corporation just do one board meeting on a Tuesday, very formal. Uh, it's very expensive. Probably the other biggest con is the, 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 the double taxation. So what does that mean? Most entities, like we talked about earlier, like a partnership, and we're going to talk about an LLC, it's that flow through taxation. So the entity itself does not pay a tax. It flows through to the people running the entity. Well, that's not the case in a C corporation. It gets double taxed. So the entity itself, at the end of the year, pays a tax. And then when the entity itself, the corporation, distributes out money, however it's distributing, maybe it's a dividend, maybe it's you know just cash, there's a tax on that. So that's the term double taxation. That's why a lot of sort of smaller entities and entrepreneurs and sort of companies uh, don't go with the C Corp to begin with because it's expensive. There's two, tax, two, two levels of tax. Um, I just want to touch real quick on that S Corp because I know there's some people are thinking about an S Corp. What an S Corp does is it gives you a lot of the, let's call it structure of a corporation in that you can issue stock, you can kind of raise capital, but it takes away that double taxation um, element. And so that's why a lot of people like it. It gives you a little bit of more of the flexibility on the financial sense. So that's kind of it in terms of corporations. So the, the last one we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna kick it to Daniel here, is an LLC. And this is sort of the behemoth, right? Most people, uh, when they think about starting a business, entity usually think of an LLC and there's a good reason for it. Yeah, the, the main reason is the limitation of liability and the flexibility of management and those types of things. An LLC is kind of a hybrid of a corporation and a partnership and a sole proprietorship. It's called a check the box entity. And what that means is you basically get to choose how you're taxed when you choose an LLC. So if you want that flow through taxation that you get with partnerships, with sole proprietorships, you can choose that with an LLC. Um, a lot of people like that pass through taxation because you get the depreciation of your equipment that you buy, the assets that are in the, um, the, the LLC, uh, everything, your, your business deductions, it all flows through to your personal tax income. And, and you know, it can bring down the, the basis of your income quite a bit because you're allowed to take advantage of those deductions. So one of the things that trips a lot of people up with LLCs is the jargon. Um, and basically, um, I'll kind of explain this with what people are more familiar with being corporations. So a corporation would have a corporate charter and that's how, that's their kind of organizational document. Whereas in an LLC, it's either called your certificate of formation or your articles of organization. And that's usually depending on what state you're in. Here in Nevada, we call it the articles of organization. The governing document um, your corporate bylaws, what uh, the rules that the managers and members and stockholders have to play by is on the LLC side called the operating agreement. Um, that's basically tells you what you can and can't do in the agreement. Um, one of the nice things about the LLC, and this is another reason why it's probably one of the most popular business organizations is you're, you have a lot of flexibility in how you design your operating agreement. So you can take kind of the nice things from partnerships, the nice things from sole proprietorships and the nice things from corporation and incorporated in that into your operating agreement. Um, the next thing is members. Members are basically shareholders, uh, but in an LLC, they're called members. Um, the membership interest is kind of like how much uh, stock you have in that company. It's your, your, your membership percentage. Uh, one of the other nice factors of LLCs, which is why this is a major consideration for, for most people, is unlike a general partnership or a partnership, you don't have to have it in those equal partner pieces. So it's not like one half, one half. I could form an, a, a, an LLC with three other people and I can own 90% of the LLC and those other two or three split that, uh, that 10% amongst themselves. So, you know, you can have someone that comes in and puts in a lot of capital up front, and then you have your kind of sweat equity guys here, and that's 10%, and they can kind of earn through their sweat equity 
um, and kind of catch up to that, that member that put in all that cash and, and up front. Um, managers are who uh, oversees the corporation. That's your board of directors or officers in, in, the, in the corporate sense. Um, and capital contributions are basically, uh, and capital accounts. So a capital contribution is what you put into the company. So let's say you have a bill for $1,000, you put in $1,000, that's your capital contribution. Uh, to piggyback on that, your capital account basically is your running balance of those contributions. So I put in $1,000, I make a payment of you know, $1,000, my capital account is zero. Uh, you know, then um, I gain a thousand dollars from a cell and I distribute half of that, uh, you know, sell to myself through a distribution. Uh, my capital account would be five hundred dollars, you know, just for a quick example. And then that brings us to waterfalls. Waterfalls are provisions in LLC agreements on who gets distributions and, and when they get them. So it's kind of like the order and pecking order of, of distributions when they do come. So you can basically have someone set up the entity where um, all the distributions go 100% to them until they're paid back for their initial capital contribution uh, and continue on with that. That, that explains waterfalls. Um, so we'll get back into some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages to LLCs. Um, I kind of have touched on some of these. So uh, basically, the main advantage is the limited liability aspect. Uh, in an LLC, you're limited to your capital contribution you put into the LLC. So for example, I put $1,000 into the LLC and someone gets injured, I'm only liable for that $1,000 I put into the LLC. Um, the flexibility that I talked about in management and profit sharing structure, uh, again, no double taxation that you get on the corporate level. But if you want to, you can elect to actually have it to where you are paying C corps uh, taxes. So there are some people that do wanna pay that on the, the corporate level and keep the funds in there and they're not gonna distribute out to themselves. So that may be a consideration of why you would choose C corp for an LLC. Um, again, flexibility um, for profits, interests and your capital contributions. Some of the disadvantages like uh, um, corporations is it's complex and it's costly. Uh, it's also, uh, it's hard to transfer interest in an LLC. A lot of times LLCs will have uh, agreements to where you can't transfer interest without offering it to the LLC first. Um, again, raising capital, uh, you know, because basically it's, it's a small business organization and generally with all these limitations on transferability and those types of things, uh, that, that, that's a reason why people won't want to raise capital because they're not able to come in and get their interest back that the, the, of the capital that they put in. Um, so then we'll kind of talk uh, about some common pitfalls uh, that people run into um, when starting businesses. Again, I kind of touched on this earlier and that's failing to properly register with state or local governments. That's a huge thing. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times we see it, but someone will be operating for like a year and they, they, they don't have a city license in the city that they're operating in or, or something like that, or, or they hadn't ever filed the, their taxes. Just, even if you're, you, you're not generating any kind of income, you still need to file taxes. Uh, it, so uh, a lot of people don't, don't understand that and, and miss that. Um, another thing, especially here in the cannabis industry is lack of compliance. Um, these are privileged licenses. Uh, so one of the things is, is a state or city, they can come in and pretty much take the license away for, for, for violating the compliance rules. And, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. There are challenges in place, but they, they always love to bring up that privileged nature of the licenses. And then again, just not consulting with professionals or consulting with the wrong professionals. I think a lot of people in this industry uh, I saw early on a lot of consultants come in and spend a lot of money and not get a lot done uh, and put a lot of people in some bad positions. So uh, just because someone represents themselves as a professional, you know, just do your due diligence and make sure that, you know, you're, you're partnering with the right person to, uh, to lead you forward. So I'll uh, kick it back to Seamus. Okay, well, I'm pretty stoked about this because we are crushing on time. We got four mm -hmm. minutes left. Um, but, but real quick, I just want to plug us here. So here's our contact information, right? You can obviously find us, go on our website. You can email Daniel and I directly whenever you want, right? And you can call us too. 
Um, and you can find us there on Instagram. I mean it, I'm serious. If, if you want to chat with us, send us an email, uh, you know, shoot, you know, call us and, and seriously, let's have a, a discussion about any of this stuff. Um, Tina, I guess I'll, I, I'm not seeing any specific questions. Maybe you guys are on your end. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything. And I know Daniel is Looks too. Like Nandi does have her hand raised. Uh, okay. Do you have a question? Well, she did. Where did she go? Oh, I don't see her on anymore. I don't know if it's rude to ask, but I'll ask one real quick, guys. Um, is there like a going rate or is it a case by case basis that you guys work with people on um, dependent on what they need help with? This is Shelby, by the way. Sure. Hey, Shelby. So we, it, we, do have, we do have set rates um, in place, but we are flexible. That's why we say, you know, contact us. We do the free consultation. Um, we're willing to work with you. So um, it is kind of a case by case basis. Great. I will, let me, let me just say one thing about that. Having litigated attorney's fees and all this type of stuff, uh, lawyers sort of rates is like a, it, it's like a very big issue in the law. And I could tell you right off the top, we are competitive for Las Vegas, for Reno. Um, and so, you know, if you come to us, like Daniel said, we're very flexible and incredibly reasonable. I can say that with confidence. That's great news. It's great news to hear, especially during these times and everybody kind of meeting. Absolutely. Oh, well, yeah. awesome to hear. And another reason, you know, why we want to be able to elevate folks that can help us, because I feel like, hey, if someone's going to become a part of an organization who's trying to impact the community yeah. and do the right thing, like that's who I want to do business with. Um, so if you guys do have any questions, we want you to know they're available. Um, they are technically our legal advisors. I know I said attorneys at the chamber because I got all excited. It's talk to our attorney, <laughs> talk to our lobbyist. I mean, who doesn't want to say that in someone's face? <laughs> um, but they, uh, Shelby actually had known uh, Daniel and everything came to fruition. And they said, you know, we'd, we'd love to be a part of this. We agree with everything you're doing. And um, here we are today. So thank you guys for doing this. Um, we're going to keep doing nuggets of knowledge once a month. It will always be on this same Thursday, the third Thursday, and try to keep it to a half an hour unless we have questions. Um, was there anyone else with a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, I do see one. Yeah, I see one. Dana, you want to take on a... Yeah, so um, basically to establish a time frame. So time frame establishing both an LLC and a C-Corp is pretty, pretty similar. Um, both of them have those formalities in place that you're going to have to go through. Uh, you know, you're going to have to get an operating agreement, a corporate charter, uh, those types of things. You're going to have to file with the IRS, get an EIN. Um, so uh, in terms of how long it takes, um, th it's about the same time. And I have a question too. Is there a certain number of people you have to have on your team for corporations? Um, not necessarily. No. Um, are you talking management? Are you talking shareholders? Uh, oh, generally, one of the things about a corporate corporate or a cor corporation is uh, they want you to have like a president, a treasurer, and what's the other one, Seamus? Um, so there's there's a secretary. Yes, there's very exactly. defined roles. That's what I was talking about, and I'll just kind of dovetail off that with the with the C corp, the corporation. It is very uh, strict and rigid. And there's a lot of law out there about how these things are supposed to be set up and how they're supposed to be managed. And so um, in terms of different slots and different roles, it's a, it's a very defined thing. So, but, and I have seen some people will have, will wear multiple hats, right? So to answer your question, Tina, how many people? Well, it may not be as many as you think, because sometimes people serve dual roles. It just depends. Okay. Uh, there was so, one, more one more question, actually. How much um, capital? I guess we so. kind of need to know, do you, do you mean uh, like a retail dispensary store or? Probably. Yeah, so the problem right now is they have not issued new licenses. Uh, so <laughs> in order to get a retail dispensary license, you've got to purchase one. Um, and they, they're expensive. They run uh, pretty in the millions of dollars. Um, and that's if you can get one. 
and find one that's for sale. Yeah. And on that note, uh, the CCB will be revoking licenses in February of 2022 that have not been built out. So we are very excited for that. We have advocated that these licenses are given to underrepresented people on the first and second rounds. Um, so that's gonna be cool to see and that will be the next time that happens. Yes, they won't necessarily be re revoked, Tina. You're oh. You're close to that, but but they are giving a deadline. So uh, for the first time, and you're very true to the date, uh, February 5th of 2022, like Tina said, um, it'll just be the first time that there's no longer the prolonging of significant progress, which they've had for uh, six years now since 2014. So she is correct that they're pretty much going to tell everybody uh, come February 6th, if you're not producing product, selling product, growing product, or uh, transporting product, uh, they're most likely going to take that license away. Um, and in that we're trying to stay abreast of what they'll be doing with those licenses, like Tina also mentioned, in hopes that they'll give them to um, or give first maybe rights to uh, minority groups. And uh, that's again, Tina all in, in the CCB's ear, which we have a scheduled meeting with in the next week or so, which we'll also make sure to mention and continue to um, ask Tyler how he intends to handle those licenses. Question from Brian. Yeah, let me jump in here because I'm seeing two here. So. With respect to Brian and Daniel, let me fit. I think Brian, you probably would want to reach out to us. I, I don't know if I'm. I want to just start pinging you about whether you need to file taxes or Reno. Because I, going back to what I said earlier, I don't want to give legal advice over here. Great consultation but, right there between. Yeah, Brian. yeah, yeah, yeah. And a plug yeah, no, for a Brian. Good. Also, guys, Brian's putting on the Lemon Hayes Golf Tournament on April 28th. The Chamber will be the Chamber of Fun, and we will be serving your drinks while you're golfing. Um, it is open bar, and there's a lot. I think there's a couple spots still left for anybody that wants to come, retailers and brands. So, shout out to Brian. Ooh. Next yeah. question from Miss Lisa. So she's asking, do we work with cannabis specific clients? We actually do. Yes. And you'll see, you'll see on our website too, our, our sort of buffet of services for cannabis. I think that you'll see that we do, uh, we have a pretty robust practice. All right. Any other questions? Do you guys feel smarter or what? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Well, if you so feel much. smarter and you like what you learned here today, you're not a member, we encourage you to become a member. Um, we want to make sure people are connecting, that we're setting ourselves up to be the best talent pool in the United States. Um, so please reach out to us if you have some qu questions, or we can also jump on a Zoom call. Um, but we will see you guys hopefully Saturday. Wear your best power outfit. Let's make a hype video. Let's have some fun. And then do a community service project. And then smoke a bunch of weed after. Uh, thank you, Seamus. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys yeah, for having us. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. It's great. Bye. Thank you. Okay.